Mr. Chancellor, Madam President, Vice Chair elect of the Board of Governors, faculty, staff, graduates, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, honored guests. Craig Oliver, OC, is one of Canada's most respected political journalists and a member of the Canadian Association of Broadcasters Hall of Fame. A reporter and television host for almost 60 years, he has covered major political events and news stories, interpreting and explaining key issues of the day with insight, candor, skill, and humor. Currently, Mr. Oliver is CTV's chief political correspondent and chief parliamentary correspondent. Now, the term news hound is defined as an aggressive reporter, or more appropriately, in my opinion, by the Cambridge English Dictionary, I think the first one was Oxford, um, as a reporter who puts a lot of effort into discovering new stories. In other words, they have a nose for uncovering new stories and new news. Now, in this age of political correctness and fake news, calling someone a news hound might appear to be somewhat disparaging or rather offensive, but not to Craig Oliver. In fact, he considers the term a compliment, and he used it in the subtitle of his highly regarded autobiographic memoir, Oliver's Twist, The Life and Times of an unapologetic news hound. Indeed, Craig Oliver is the quintessential news hound, or should I say, the quintessential Canadian news hound, because Canada is ingrained throughout his astonishing career as a reporter, journalist, and political commentator. As we sang our national anthem at the commencement of this ceremony, I was reminded of one of the many amusing anecdotes in his book where he describes one of his very first assignments at the CBC radio station in Prince Rupert, in which he had to host the morning wake-up show because the regular host had arrived too drunk to perform. Now, CBC regulations required that every morning, programming must begin with the national anthem. But a fellow announcer had hidden the officially approved CBC recording and so Craig Oliver improvised and sang the national anthem in full voice, much to the displeasure of his bosses at the time. <clears throat> Despite this ingenuity and quick thinking, cousin Craig, as he was known on the radio at that time, received the first of his many written reprimands that he would receive throughout his career. Now that was in 1956 when, at 18, Mr. Oliver was the youngest CBC announcer in the country at the smallest radio station in the country. But that experience set him on his career path as a news hound. Because, as he writes, in those early days before the unions, the announcer's job included news gathering and reporting. And this perfectly suited my inherent curiosity about other people's business. Finally, a legitimate reason to ask otherwise rude questions of important people. And so began a career path that is covered with colorful stories from its beginning in Prince Rupert to the coverage of the critical universal health debate in the 1960s at CBC Saskatchewan in Regina, where he met former NDP leader Tommy Douglas and another prairie icon, then progressive conservative leader John Diefenbaker. Following his move to CTV in, in 1972, Craig Oliver has done it all, serving as the network's director of news and current affairs, producer of Canada AM's inaugural episodes, and as political correspondent in Washington. He has a storage closet full of stories and opinions on the high-profile political leaders of the last 40 to 50 years, especially his vivid descriptions of canoe trips taken over his career into Canada's far north with members of the Rideau Canal and Arctic Canoe Club, which included former Liberal MP John Godfrey, former Liberal Cabinet Minister Alan Rock, and former Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau. All of this would be cause enough for Carlton, as the home of Canada's oldest and most renowned journalism program, to award Craig Oliver an honorary degree. 
But there is more that links him to Carleton's unique identity. As Canada's foremost university in serving people with disabilities. In the mid 1970s, at the age of 35, Craig Oliver was diagnosed with glaucoma, an incurable and progressive eye disease. But he did not allow this condition to deter him from his career or his life. And Mr. Oliver has become an inspiration to visually impaired persons, hosting a program on Accessible Media Inc.'s AMI TV called Challenges and Change with Craig Oliver an interview-based program with Canadians who have inspired change and helped reshape the perception of ability. During his long and distinguished career, Craig Oliver has won multiple awards, including two Gemini Awards, as well as the President's Award from the Radio and Television News Directors Association, the Gold Ribbon Award from the Canadian Association of Broadcasters, and the Charles Lynch Award from the National Press Gallery. He has honorary doctorates from the University of Regina and Nipissing University, and in 2012, he was named an Officer of the Order of Canada and presented with the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal by Governor General David Johnson. Mr. Chancellor, in recognition of his outstanding career as a Gemini-winning journalist, political commentator, news director, producer, and author, and for his inspirational achievements in combating and overcoming blindness, I request that you confer the degree of Doctor of Laws honoris causa upon Craig Oliver. By virtue of the authority vested in me by the Board of Governors and upon recommendation by the University Senate, I confer upon you the degree Doctor of Laws honoris causa. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Mr. Chancellor, Madam President, I have to say that I know how much this university appreciates the work you have done for them in nine years of guiding this institution so well. I hear that from everyone. Thank you on behalf of them all, if I may. Uh, members, of the board of, members of the Board of Governors, Ladies and gentlemen, parents, especially grandparents, <laughs> in my case, I can't tell you how honored and keenly I appreciate uh, this honor. Just to be on the stage with Mr. Jackson, but Tom Jackson is enough for me, uh, especially since I grew up in a largely First Nations community on the, almost on the Alaska border, and my closest friend to the day he died was the son of a of a chief of the Simpson people. And my son recently retired as the editorial boss of Aboriginal People's Television, so this is a total surprise to me. I've always regretted that I didn't get a better education. In fact, I didn't finish high school because the job at the radio station paid better, I suppose. Uh, so this is keenly appreciated for that reason, too. I will now be able to look in the eye of all of those young people who are graduates of this fine journalism school, who I've hired as bureau chief and others have hired since me, uh, and I've gotten to know them well and appreciate them. And the reason we've hired so many graduates from here is because not one of us, not one of them, has ever let us down. And I don't think you can get a better tribute to a journalism school than that. Some advice now. I think advice is always warranted. The first is don't start the way I did. I received the letter on July the 1st, 1956, saying you'll start work at 10 a.m. at the radio station uh, that day, July the 1st, 1956. I realized that that's Canada Day. So I thought, well, I guess I'll come in tomorrow. And, and they called. The manager called and said, where are you? I said, well, it's, a, it's Canada Day. It's a day off. He said, my God, you, you've only just started work. 
and already you want a day off? <laughs> Get in here, he said. The news never stops. Or I'll fire you even before you've started. My first assignment was a program called Message Period. Uh, many of the First Nations communities and others in the canneries and fisheries uh, villages nearby couldn't communicate. And so what they did is the ham operators would phone in messages to the radio station. We would read them so all the communities could communicate a bit. One morning, I read this. To the relatives of Joe McKay, Mr. McKay died last night in Prince Rupert General Hospital. Would his relatives please come in and look after his affairs? 20 minutes later, I got a call from Joe McKay. <laughs> I'm not dead, he said. Uh, oh, said I, I'm sorry. No, I'm not sorry. Uh, I'm sorry that I got it wrong. He said, no, it's okay. Please put a message on that I'm not dead and, and tell them uh, that I'll let them know when I'm dead. Uh, the lesson there, by the way, is if you make a mistake, correct it, even if it's not your fault, because you were wrong, uh, and apologize if necessary. I also had to read ads. There was a woman there named Rita, a respectable local woman, very respectable, who decided to go into business in a beauty salon um, for the local elegant ladies in this town of 12,000 fishermen, hunters, pulp mill workers. And uh, so I read her ad on her opening day. I said, you know, be sure to visit Rita's Beauty Saloon. <laughs> Wait a minute. So she was ready to sue the radio station if we hadn't corrected that because all kinds of inebriated men were pounding on the door looking to meet a beauty. <laughs> I learned one great lesson that I've never forgotten at that little station so many years ago. That was because twice a week, we had to empty the garbage, which was awful, flies buzzing around our heads, and we used to have to clean the toilets. As you can imagine, there were no unions in those days. Uh, so one day I was scrubbing out a bowl, and the chief announcer said to me, remember this is a town of 12,000 people uh, that nobody ever heard of. Um, he said to me, Oliver, do you know why we're doing this? And I said, uh, no, sir. In those days, your boss was sir or mister. He said, because our powerful and important jobs should not make us too proud. Humility is a great quality and a great quality trait in any person. And I urge you to follow it if you can. Don't be too proud, whatever you're doing for a living. People will love you for it. Over the 60 years I've been working, and when you think about it, that's three times what I would have got for murder. Long time. Uh, I think that one common denominator I found in the people who've succeeded and failed and often succeeded again has been that they have tried to live an ethical life. And what could be more important right now, at this time, in world history than, than ethics. And at the core of ethics is the idea of truth. We have a man at the White House now who has an interesting relationship with the truth. <laughs> he, believes, he believes that this, my opinion trumps your truth or your reality. It doesn't matter. Observable facts are not important. My truth is important, and the truth of those who believe in me. Well, I can tell you from years of watching it that public policy based on lies or fo phony false narratives or propaganda will always fail. And if you have any doubt about that, and the consequences that come from lies from public people and the misconceptions that creates in the minds of others. Think about the war in Vietnam, 68,000 dead. Think about the war in Iraq, 3,000 dead. Both of them started on a lie. Think about the phony payoff uh, scandal 
in the Canadian Senate. And finally, think about the fact that the President has decreed because global warming is a hoax, it's not the truth, he's concluded that he will pull out of the Paris Agreement and, and future generations may pay a price for that. We don't know. So how do people know what to believe in a world where truth is, seems a, uh, an old idea, a worn out cliche? I think what they do is they go to reliable sources, independent, fact-based, who they have learned to trust in the past. And if you lead an ethical life and are an ethical person, you will be trusted. It's one of the great values of an ethical life. You can make deals with people. You can be an intermediary because people will know when they need to know that you'll tell them the way things really are. So I urge that on you. So that's it from me. Over to you and your generation. Get out there. Make change. Not too much change. Not too fast. That's how, at my age, you start to feel. But lead. Lead the country as you go out into your working and personal lives. And as you do, do this for me, because I probably won't be around for a lot of the time you'll be around. Obviously, I won't. Do this for me. Take good care of this precious country of ours. Thank you.